Hi, thanks for coming to this Unicon webinar. My name is Bill Thompson. I'm a software architector and a director of IAM for Unicon. And I'm joined with my colleague, Dima Kopalenko, also a software architect for Unicon. And we're going to chat about CAS and SHIB and how they are more perfect together. A little bit about me. I've uh, been with Unicon for about a year and a half now and uh, leading their IAM practice. do a lot of work with CAS, SHIB, and Grouper. I've got a long history in higher education. Recently, I was at Princeton University for a few years. I was at Rutgers, uh, leading their architecture and engineering group. Ema, you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. Um, so uh, I've been um, working for Unicon for about a year now. And before that, um, I was working as software architect for uh, Rutgers University, uh, also with Bill for about nine years. Um, an early Spring Framework committer. I've been using Spring Framework since it was a Spring Framework and adopted the whole Spring Framework portfolio throughout uh, the enterprise uh, Java development at uh, Raptor. And also, I'm actively involved in the JSC CAS development uh, community. Thank you, Dima. So, a little about Unicon. Unicon's been a trusted partner since 1993. We have deep expertise in open source software for education, not just our, uh, our daily access management components, but uh, portals and learning management systems. And now Student Success Plan, which is a new project with JSIG. So, um, Unicon's uh, business model is to support open source software for higher education, both by working directly with the communities and providing an innovative cooperative support program that provides a more traditional support model and ensures you have a successful deployment and uh, ongoing maintenance for these products. So the uh, agenda today is to talk about what we mean by CAS and SHIB being more perfect together. I'm going to talk a little bit about what Enterprise Web SSO is and some of the challenges there, and then how CAS and SHIB are used to satisfy some of these needs and challenges. We'll go a little bit in technical detail of how that all works together and a few demos and then a little fun. So let's get started. So Enterprise Web Single Sign-On, um, which is what we're really talking about here, both CAS and SHIB can be deployed in you know, more defined scenarios with a limited scope. But what we're really trying to tackle here is really sort of an enterprise-wide Web SSO and then, of course, with the SHIB base, you know, the, the federated Web SSO. So some of the things, challenges you know, you'll run into when, when trying to deploy it for really sort of across the board as an enterprise architecture. So first of all, is user experience and expectations. Folks have grown accustomed to how the current systems on campus work with regards to logging in or logging out or the credentials they use or the passwords that they use or the net, net ID that they use for logging in different applications. So the, off the bat, you're running to the having to work within whatever context you find yourself with regards to current user experiences and what their likely expectation is for how Web SSO should work. You also will have to integrate with existing IAM architecture and infrastructure. So maybe you have multiple net IDs and would like to start to make progress to narrowing that down to a single username and password. You may have your namespaces managed uh, differently depending on what kind of user they are. Web SSO is just a, a, a one part of an IAM architecture, so figuring out how to get that uh, integrated well with your existing system is, is a challenge. Of course, a lot of times Web SSO uh, is driven by enterprise portal deployment, so figuring out how to do proxy authentication or delegate authentication or how to seamlessly integrate content that works well with your Web SSO solution can be a challenge. And then, of course, you're going to run into you know, sort of closed-sourced enterprise systems that uh, may or may not have support for your web SSO system of choice, and they may or may not have good authentication APIs for doing sort of front-end integration. So these, these can all be quite challenges. But this is what we're, we're trying to tackle, right? We're trying to tackle uh, the, the majority or the major web-based applications on campus with a web SSO offer. So some more other challenges, you may have plenty of homegrown applications, you know, everything from ASP to Zope and everything in between in terms of uh, web apps that may have been created that you might want to bring into the web SSO domain. You know, one of the nice things about CAS is that it's, you know, it's been around for quite a while now. It has good out-of-the-box support for a number of applications that uh, we see deployed on campuses, including Sky, New Portal, and 
WordPress, Zimbra, and many others. Of course, then there's going to be some of the hard cases like uh, Outlook uh, Web Access and, and IMAP and others where we may not have uh, the ability to integrate directly with WebSSO, and so you may find yourself having to take other approaches. We'll talk about that. And then finally, there's Federation, um, and in common, of course, and uh, it's certainly becoming more and more a hard requirement for any WebSSO system. So, PAS is great. It's got a long history and tremendous adoption, both within higher education and, and out, for a WebSSO platform uh, for enterprise deployment. Some of the reasons why that is, you know, one, it's got a flexible user experience. So PAS doesn't try to dictate one particular approach, but allows campuses to tailor um, the user experience to, to best meet their needs. It's supple, extensible, and elegant. These were design criteria all the way back to 2005 um, when Rutgers and Yale collaborated on the PAS 3.0 design. You know, it's easy to deploy, scale, and operate. You know, PAS itself tries to be very simple, tries to make configuration of the normal cases very easy, um, but also make, you know, the uh, extensibility for other cases, you know, possible you know, via spring configuration. Um, it already has multi-protocol support uh, for CAS and subset of SAML. And more recently, uh, OAuth has come into the CAS in the 3.5 release. So it's a simple protocol with a wide range of clients and out-of-the-box support. So getting closer to that vision of sort of enterprise-wide web SSO, you know, is possible with, with a good CAS. And of course, there's a huge adoption across higher education already and great support both within the community and, of course, the Unicon cooperative support program. So SHIP is great, too. You're not likely to find a more robust SAML implementation. And not only that, but support for federation and specifically the in common federation. A lot of products claim to have SAML support, but that you know, really isn't sufficient in and of itself to do the kinds of things you'd like to do to be able to join uh, a federation like common. There's a growing list of cloud-based SAML services that use SAML for the authentication mechanism. And of course, the in common plus uh, services offering continues to grow. Of course, then there's other aspects of um, federation and federated identity that come into play, and, and SHIB is poised well to implement some of these things and, and play well with them, including sort of levels of assurance, of course, Federal ICAMP and uh, NSTIC. As these things evolve, I, I suspect that, that SHIB will play a big part in how those things evolve and uh, be a tool to implement um, guidance coming out of those communities. So we find lots of campuses deploying CAS and SHIB for all the reasons in those following two slides. SHIB providing fantastic SAML and federation support and CAS providing great enterprise-wide web SSO ability to uh, leverage the you know, robust clients on a large number of platforms especially for the applications that, you know, you may not need federation support, but you just need to bring into a web SSO domain for your local campuses. Um, it's hard to go wrong with CAS or even find a, a better or a more simpler solution. So the real trick is, how do we get CAS and SHIB working together? We don't want two separate web SSO domains. We really just want one. And for a long while, folks have been deploying CAS and SHIB and basically casifying the SHIB server via uh, something called remote user, does a good job at bridging the two SSO domains. It was a good solution, but was missing some of the, the features that, that SAML supported. Um, those two features are called is passive and forced authentication. And CAS has analogous features um, on the CAS world called uh, is renew, you know, renew equals true, which is uh, forced authentication. And uh, is passive is called gateway on the past side. What we want, what we needed was a way to sort of bridge more of the SAML features over to the CAS server. And this is this is what we've recently done, and why and why the slides are called or this presentation is, is titled CAS and SHIB more perfectly together. Um, so I've gotten my head of myself a little bit on the slides here. So is passive equals gateway and forced off equals renew. Um, and this is facilitated by um, a SHIB API called external authentication. So this is a more sophisticated integration scenario than just simply classifying the SHIB server and, and using remote users. So the component is called CAS SHIB Authenticator. And this is something that was uh, developed by Unicon with, with 
and mostly by uh, Dimitri. He's going to show us a little demo of that and talk about the technical details in just a bit. Um, this picture tries to show kind of overall this sort of web single sign-on domain. And uh, the enterprise web SSO box, that green box there, kind of in the middle, showing how we have integrated both the SHIB IDP and JSIG CAS to provide um, an overall enterprise web SSO capability. You know, so the products are the SHIB IDP and JSIG CAS, but the overall capability is an enterprise web SSO that provides great user experience, um, that provides um, easy integration for local camp, uh, campus app web applications on a wide variety of platforms and languages, um, and also provides great uh, federation and SAML support for your ship. So we have another kind of drill down into that a little bit, and again showing kind of the, the, the multi-protocol nature of the solution uh, and uh, how the, kind of the components all come together. You know, basically this is bridging the CAS and SHIB SSO domains. So there's, there's one single SSO um, uh, session. In, in this scenario, the user only ad interacts directly with the CAS login flow. So any customizations that you might do via Spring uh, Webflow at the CAS server, for instance, to do um, acceptable use policy or um, you know, password expiration or password reset or any other kind of notification or customization that you might want to do in a CAS Webflow um, is there. Uh, and the user only ever sees the, the CAS uh, user interface and credential challenges. Um, so CAS controls a single sign-on session um, and, that in, and that bridges over into the SHIB IDP. Okay, so I'm now going to switch our screen share over to Dimitri. So let's just do a little demo. What I have here is two local servers Comcast running. One is running provider, Shibboleth, and I also have a, a little simple service provider running in Apache. It's a little PHP page that has just uh, displayed an attribute that's being released by uh, IDP. So the SP and IDP are all configured and connected. And also on, on the uh, IDP side, it's configured with this external authentication handler when request comes in, so the IDP will forward to ShapeCast Authenticator via uh, this uh, external login handler. And at that point, it will make a request to uh, so-called bridge that is a little uh, web resource that is a cast protected resource that then would uh, now forward to CAS, so the user would have this rich uh, uh, login experience by CAS, and at that point in the CAS land, it will do the uh, authentication to a, a backend authentication uh, a store, and it will do the generation of ticket granting ticket and the service ticket generation and validation, all the CAS protocol uh, uh, back and forth. And uh, once it's all done, then the, the actual cast protected resource, the bridge, will make a redirect a call back to IDP land to a, a little servlet that's deployed in the IDP called a callback servlet, where it will have access to the authenticated principle in the request. And it will take that authenticated principle and put it in the context of the IDP and forward the processing back to, to IDP. So then, at that point, IDP will have the authenticated principle and it will continue to do its job as is and forward to, uh, to uh, service provider. So that, that's a little bit multiple description, but I just want to make sure that that's what happened under the hood. Uh, that's what you would see. So I have all these components running. So if I now uh, make a request to service provider, and then you would see a CAS screen here. So it happened pretty quickly. And we'll try to uh, uh, log in here. And then we are now back into the uh, IDP land. And, you know, IDP has that uh, authenticated principle uh, passed by CAS to it. And then 
is it did all the rest of its processing, like attributes and uh, forwarding to the uh, service provider uh, page. So that concludes the live demo portion. So uh, now I just want to quickly uh, uh, walk through the request uh, sequence diagram and what happens uh, during this whole uh, authentication request. Here we see uh, the very first component called IDP authentication engine. That's the standard uh, uh, Shibboleth IDP uh, component. That that is the front for any authentication request that come in from service providers. And at that point, the request comes in, and a standard login call to the login handler happens. And that login handler basically is the uh, plugin point in IDP. For, for different implementations of login handler. So uh, in this instance, we are utilizing the external uh, login handler of uh, IDP pre-configured to actually uh, invoke our uh, CAS authentication bridge. There is no code, there's all configuration, and it's pre-configured to uh, do HTTP GET uh, request to this uh, so-called uh, CAS invoker server. So that's where the bridge implementation starts. So that CAS invoker servlet are configured on the uh, URI under slash auth slash external, uh, and it uh, is deployed within the IDP context. And once that servlet get, gets the service request, it then knows how to invoke the actual CAS protected resource. So as you see, it issues the HTTP GET request to the thing called CAS facade report. So that is the little uh, front uh, web resource uh, deployed outside of the IDP context and protected by standard CAS client filters. At that point, standard CAS filter machinery uh, takes care of intercepting the request and uh, redirecting to the CAS login page. At that point, we are in the uh, CAS uh, land there. So user enters the credential, CAS authenticates, and then issues the ticket granting ticket and the service ticket. Then service ticket gets validated, the standard CAS protocol. Facade resource finally gets the uh, response back from CAS with the authenticated principle available. Uh, then back authenticated principle into the request attribute and issues the uh, HTTP GET request back to so-called external authentication callback. So that external callback basically is another second service that is deployed within the IDP context that basically once the receives the request back from the CAS bridge, unpacks the uh, request object, gets the authenticated principle, and calls standard authentication engine return to authentication engine method. That's a static method that basically gives control back to IDP. And IDP at that point has access to a successfully authenticated principle and then continues its processing pipeline towards the uh, service provider. So that's basically in a nutshell the walkthrough of this whole sequence. So to recap, the whole architecture is Two small servers uh, deployed in the IDP context. One is to invoke a uh, CAS protected resource, and the other one is to receive callback uh, from, from CAS protected resource. And then the CAS protected resource itself, which is deployed externally to IDP context, that's basically uh, a gateway to a CAS processing pipeline. And that is SHIP CAS authenticator architecture in a nutshell. Bill? Great. Thank you, David. Okay, so I think that shows a great example of deploying CAS and, and SHIB together and perhaps more perfect together. And Unicon has done plenty of deployments of this and we've seen lots of campuses uh, be, have run CAS and SHIB together for, for a number of years already um, with great success. I want to point out another approach which is perhaps less common but still has found um, uses um, and that's to go the other way around. So instead of essentially casifying your SHIB server, you might want to uh, shibbleize your, your CAS server. And that's what this little project called CAS SHIB does. Uh, basically shibbleizing the CAS server so that you, know, you enable end applications to get authentication information from CAS rather than 
Raylan Shibesky. So using your CAS client and CAS essentially as server as a service provider and users interact directly with the IDP um, and back again. But on your on your application side, you're using a simple CAS client rather than rather than a full blown SHIB SP. Uh, so again, this is this is I think um, has some uh, use cases. Um, so I'm really just kind of pointing it out here as sort of rather another interesting kind of integration. Um, but more often than not, the way we see CAS and SHIB deployed is um, with the CAS anchoring the web SSO session. Um, in the way that Dima, uh, Dima described earlier. So, another interesting thing we've done lately um, was to bridge uh, ADFS to SHIB to CAS. We did this early in the year in 2012 for a proof of concept with uh, Juilliard um, in New York City. And uh, I've got a little video here that shows, shows that um, a little bit. And what you see here is um, configuring ADFS to integrate well with um, Shibboleth. And, and this, this part of it is, is pretty well known. Um, you can find documentation here to basically use ADFS really kind of as an IDP proxy to Shib. Um, so here are, here's us signing in to uh, Office 365, which was a target application, which at the time required ADFS. Um, so you see the login goes over to ADFS, uh, where I can sh select my SHIB IDP um, that we pre-configured before, and then I can uh, click login. And here you'll see that we've been forwarded already to the CAS server. So this is using that CAS SHIB integration. Um, so we're going to authenticate directly to CAS, um, which is going to bounce us back to IDP via CAS protocol, pick up a SAML assertion. That's going to be bounced back to ADFS uh, via SAML, pick up a WS Fed token, and then ultimately all the way back to Office 365. So um, from an end user experience, what this has enabled is a seamless uh, WebSSO domain, uh, harking back to our earlier slides, but this time not only with CAS and SHIB, but also with ADFS. I should note now that as of the summer of 2012, Microsoft has announced direct SHIB support for Office 365, um, in which case the ADFS bridge is no longer required. So that, that's good news. And we can go back to just deploying SHIB and CAS in a more, a more perfect scenario. So here's some resources. Um, the SHIB CAS authenticator that, that Dima uh, put together is open source, of course and up on GitHub, and you're welcome to download that and use that and play with that, and uh, certainly would be happy to answer any questions uh, about that, or likely on the CAS dev list, or, or you can email us directly. JSIG website also has some information on sort of CAS SHIB integration. And also, Unicon has started to use GitHub and a public repo to share other interesting CAS integrations um, and ultimately SHIB integrations that we've done. Um, a lot of times in client engagements, we end up with a lot of open source that isn't uh, immediately you know, obvious whether or not it should go into, say, the core CAS distribution or, or SHIB distributions. We've started to track these in public GitHub repos because they're open source and we want to share them so you can find those up on, up on GitHub too. So that's it. I uh, appreciate you taking the time to view our presentation. Again, I'm, I'm Bill Thompson, and join my, yeah, my colleague, uh, Dima Kopolenko, and uh, we thank you for your time.